Hello, and welcome back to Plastics and Society, the only college course that posts all its lectures online for free. How's that for radical pedagogy? This week, we're going to talk about a bunch of different polymer processing methods, basically everything that couldn't fit into the last few weeks. Then we're going to get into how plastic recycling works in practice and whether it's enough to handle the scope of the plastic pollution crisis. As we're going over these processing methods, remember what we discussed in lecture one about plastics material properties. Understanding the structure property relationships of polymers is critical to understanding how recycling actually works. But of course, I'll give a little teeny tiny review for those who don't want to watch that entire hour long lecture. Oh, and definitely watch the videos that I've posted below in the description about plastic bottles and fast fashion before watching this video. Finally, a couple people expressed interest in watching these videos casually without taking my class for college credit. That's fine, I guess. I just make less money. If you want to skip all the polymer processing stuff and skip right to the part where we talk about recycling and whether or not it's real, you can skip to this time code on screen right now. Gosh, I'm like a real YouTuber now. Maybe I should maybe I should do a thumbnail face like or how about this? Or Is that good? Anyway, no time for pleasantries this time. On with the show. Broadly speaking, we can fit all polymer processing methods into five categories. Continuous and molded coatings, which I'm skipping in this run of the course, but it's what my PhD on. So if you're curious, just ask me. Dye forming, which we talked about in our extrusion lecture. Molding, as we discussed in the past couple lectures. And stretch shaping, which can extend into fiber spinning, film blowing, blow molding, thermoforming, or any other method where you take a polymer and stretch it into its final form. Today, we're going to talk about blow molding, thermoforming, and fiber spinning. I'll also throw in a very brief bit about how foams are made because some of y'all expressed interest in that. Blow molding is a process used to make parts that are pretty much hollow, most famously beverage bottles, but also bottles for other types of liquids, plastic trash cans, other kinds of everyday containers, and even storage tanks for harsh chemicals. If you know anything about glass blowing, this process is largely very similar. The basic premise is that we can take a little bit of plastic, heat it up until it's in a stretchable yet solid state, place it inside of a mold, and then blow air into it so that it fits the shape of the mold. Aside from film blowing, this method we discussed previously where a tall bubble of film is stretched vertically and then collapsed into a thin film, the two main methods of blow molding are extrusion blow molding and in injection stretch blow molding. In extrusion blow molding, a thin tube of molten thermoplastic polymer called the parison is placed between the mold halves, which then clamp together around the tube as air is blown through the center. The mold is then quickly cooled so that the part cures and the finished part can be ejected. Like with injection molding, this process is possible thanks to a reciprocating screw, which unlike most extruders, which operate continuously, can eject a small amount of polymer melt before pulling back and collecting more. This method is mostly used for smaller parts, and while it does use some flash trimming, it also allows for handles to be made using pinch points in the mold. Extrusion blow molding can also make bottles that have multiple layers, which is useful for storing harsh chemicals like bleach or motor oil. Several extruders working in parallel can co-extrude a plastic tube that, for example, has a chemically resistant polymer on the inside layer and a scratch and impact resistant plastic on the outer layer, and a cheaper plastic or a plastic made from lowered quality recycled material in the middle. These multi-material bottles obviously present a huge challenge to their recyclability, but more on that later. The other type of blow molding is injection stretch blow molding. These involve the blow molding of pre-made bottle precursors called preforms that are really easily produced via injection molding, hence the name. These preforms are then heated to their rubbery temperature, and the process continues as before. Air is blown into the center of the preform until it fits to the edges of the mold and cools to its final shape. Here you can see the progression of a PET preform all the way to the final bottle. These pictures were taken by removing the plastic at different stages of the blowing process. Remember that in real life, the process takes place over a few seconds. The advantage of ISBM is that it involves no flash trimming. After blowing, you get the full bottle in its final form. It's also scalable to much larger bottle sizes like the ones you see in water coolers. ISBM is usually done in a two-stage process where preforms are injection molded upstream either by another company or by the same company earlier in the process and then heated and then blown. But a much less common method is one stage ISBM, which again uses a reciprocating screw to make a preform, which is then cooled slightly before heading straight to the blow molding operation. 
thermodynamically, this saves some energy. Instead of heating nurdles into a melt, then cooling them down to room temperature, then heating them again for the blow molding step, you only have to heat the plastic once. However, this is thermally efficient, but not process efficient. It essentially ties up the blow molding equipment during the cooling period because you can't extrude another preform while the last one cools. It's far more practical from a manufacturing perspective to produce a bunch of preforms using injection molding, then do all the blow molding, especially when you consider that sometimes the injection molding of preforms and blow molding of those preforms might be done by two totally different companies. Let's talk about polymer properties for a bit to get our minds refreshed on structure property relationships. For most commercial beverage bottles, the mold in the blow molding machine is kept pretty cold, often somewhere between three to 10 degrees Celsius. And that's for two reasons. First of all, the bottle cools more quickly against a cold mold. And so the process can move along faster. But we can also talk about how the temperature affects the crystallinity of the final product because the crystallinity of a plastic part affects the overall strength and permeability of the bottle. We can also talk about orientation. When all the polymer chains are oriented in a similar direction, the material becomes stronger in that direction. A faster cool time means slightly less crystallinity, meaning it has a lower glass transition temperature, but it also results in a lower permeability to oxygen and carbon dioxide, about half that of a non-oriented, totally amorphous film of the same material. This biaxial orientation of PET chains in the bottle leads to both high flexibility and a high impact strength, along with lower permeability, which is what allows plastic bottles to contain things like soda and other pressurized, supersaturated carbonated drinks without them going flat. On the other hand, if you keep the mold warm, closer to 100 degrees Celsius, and you hold the bottle there for a short period, which allows those crystalline structures to form, the crystallinity of the bottle goes up. This will increase the glass transition temperature of the final bottle, which will give the bottle added strength, a higher glass transition temperature, and an even lower permeability to gases. This is how things like gas canisters or hot water bottles are made. Keeping the mold warmer changes the crystallinity and orientation of the polymers in such a way that it becomes stronger. Have you ever tried to fill a regular water bottle with warm liquid or left a water bottle in a hot car? If you have, you know that the bottle gets kind of flexible. That doesn't happen with bottles designed for hot filling and not just because they're thicker. It's because of the increased crystallinity and orientation that comes with using a hot mold. And of course, sometimes different materials besides PET are used altogether. Side note, please don't fill regular water bottles with warm water and don't leave your plastic bottles in extreme heat, including your car. They can actually start to melt and leach plastic and antimony into your water. If you need to store hot water for any reason, use a thermos or a hot water bottle. They've been out there for a long time for staying warm in bed, dealing with cramps and other uses. If you're curious about what kinds of materials can be used with blow molding, pretty much any thermoplastic can be blow molded, usually PET for common beverage bottles or polyethylene for thicker bottles. PVC can also be used. In fact, it was used for hot water bottles for a while, but as we've discussed in previous lectures, it's super toxic, so try to avoid it when you can. And then again, making PET bottles does involve the use of an antimony catalyst, which itself is super toxic, especially when it leaches out of the bottle. But whatever, anyway, on to the next topic. Next up, we're talking about thermoforming. Now begins our polymer processing variety hour. I won't talk about these next few methods with too much depth in this video, but if you're taking my class for credit, my slide deck on Canvas will have a lot more info. Thermoforming involves heating up a plastic sheet and manipulating it into a different shape, usually with either vacuum, applied pressure, or some other mechanical force. Unlike compression molding, which takes place at incredibly high temperatures and pressures, this is mostly done at normal conditions, although there's a huge restriction on what kinds of materials can be used, since there's often high material waste in the form of flash that needs to be trimmed. Thermoforming is used in everything from small part packaging to large car parts. If you've ever bought something that was perfectly cradled in plastic packaging, that means it was probably thermoformed that way. Thermoformed parts are designed to perfectly fit the products that they're trying to package. Blister packs and skin packs for toys, like these fake products from the Instagram page, Obvious Plant, but also many real products are made with thermoforming, as are many pill containers and food containers. Here's a quick video of some cups being made with thermoforming. As opposed to injection molding, which can be more difficult to scale up because you need many instruments making one cup at a time, 
Thermoforming machines like this can make dozens of cups from a single sheet of material in seconds. Here's another video of the body of a kayak being made with thermoforming. A warmed up polyethylene sheet is pulled over a mold and then vacuumed down to fit the shape of the mold more precisely. After being fitted with the cockpit padding and affixed to the epoxy composite hull with a strong adhesive, it's fully a kayak. I'll also briefly mention that it's possible to thermoform multiple sheets of material simultaneously, like with this sign example, as long as the two materials have comparable glass transition temperatures. It's also not uncommon for people to use 3D printing to make prototype molds for a few hundred thermoformed parts. Although fiberglass and metal are more common in industry, when you need to make hundreds of thousands of identical parts. Yeah, just 3D printing plastic so we can thermoform more plastic. Uh, it's a shame all those molds probably aren't able to be reused for anything. And also thermoforming is pretty energy intensive and wasteful considering all the flash that has to get trimmed off. Anyway, let's talk about fashion. Fashion is something I clearly know a lot about. Just kidding, I wear the same pair of jeans daily and I have a capsule wardrobe where I rotate between four to five safe outfits for years at a time. But even if you're a minimalist like me, many of our clothes these days are made from polyester. This is a fairly new thing, historically speaking, with nylon, the first commercially viable synthetic fiber, first being introduced in the 1940s, and polyester overtaking cotton as the most popular clothing material in the year 1990. Like I touched on in my extrusion lecture, a certain kind of dye, called a spinneret can also be used to produce thin strands of plastic material. But that's not all there is to it. After extrusion, fibers used for clothing go through several post-processing steps before getting weaved into that H&M top. Let's focus on polyester. It's by no means the only synthetic fiber material out there, but it is the most popular. Polyester is actually the name for a class of polymer materials. In science land, it just means any polymer chain featuring this repeating ester group in blue, where R can be any other structure. But generally, if we're talking about clothing, we're talking about PET, the same material used for bottles, which is why you may have recently seen a t-shirt being sold as being made from recycled bottles. The act of extruding polyester through the spinneret orients the polymer fibers in the drawing direction, increasing their strength and increasing the resilience of the fiber. Then after extrusion, polyester goes through several post-processing steps. The fiber is drawn until it has a uniform thickness, twisted, loosened in a process called hanking to make the fiber more receptive to dyeing, then chemically dyed. It's a multi-step process that uses lots of chemicals. Are they, are they just standing around open vats of acid? What the fuck? Finally, let's talk about foams. These are another form of plastic that we interact with every day in the form of food containers and packaging, and also invisibly in the form of insulation for our homes or even the interiors of our refrigerators. Not to get too into the weeds, but a foam is really just any gas trapped in a liquid or solid medium, from soap suds to foam on beverages to Diet Coke and Mentos. If you wanted to get semantic, you can say that wood is a foam, given that it's a closed cell structure composed of lignin, cellulose, and air. But now we're getting into real is cereal soup territory, and such philosophical questions are beyond the scope of this class. Foams can either be open cell, meaning that the gas pockets connect and something like liquid can travel through it, or closed cell, meaning the gas pockets are not connected. Sponges, for example, are an open cell foam because when a sponge gets wet, the water travels through it. Meanwhile, mattresses, flotation devices, and most insulation is designed to not let air or liquid travel through, for good reason. Chemically speaking, how do you make foam? Consider the explosive foaming reaction you get when you put Mentos into Diet Coke. The liquid carbon dioxide in the soda turns into gaseous carbon dioxide because of the sugar in the candy. Or consider elephant toothpaste, a common science demo for kids that combines hydrogen peroxide, yeast, and soapy water to make huge amounts of solid foam. The yeast breaks down hydrogen peroxide liquid into oxygen gas, which gets trapped by the soapy water. In both of these cases, we have a liquid turned into a gas by a catalyst that is then trapped inside of a liquid medium. Polymer foams are very similar, often combining a monomer with a blowing agent. For example, polystyrene and polyurethane behave like most thermoplastic materials when processed normally, but when mixed with a blowing agent like diisocyanate in an oxygen-rich environment, polyurethane becomes foamy. These blowing agents, like the yeast in elephant toothpaste, allow a single polymer phase 
to nucleate into air-filled bubbles and form an open or closed cell foam. There are lots of ways this foam ends up getting shaped, but perhaps the most common is simple molding or casting, where all the ingredients are injected into a closed mold. This is how everything from foam sports balls to foam sandals to foam pillows get made. Another variation of this is reactive injection molding. This is where low viscosity reacting monomers or pre-polymers are mixed right before injected into a hot cavity where they react and solidify. This is used for super high quality, super low density materials like car spoilers or certain specialized insulation. It's also pretty common to inject or spray foam directly into where it's going to end up. For example, the insides of refrigerators contain a layer of insulation that's added by filling the interior of the fridge with the foaming ingredients and waiting. Or for home insulation, it's not uncommon for HVAC technicians to install foam with a special nozzle that mixes the polymer and foaming agents right as they exit the nozzle. Mind you, this is extremely dangerous as are all of these foaming methods because blowing agents are often very volatile and carcinogenic. You might also see extruded foam where wall-sized blocks of foam are created and then trimmed down by hand or by CNC routers to get their final shape. Finally, we have expanded foam molding where polymer beads are expanded to fit the shape of a mold as opposed to injecting liquid reagents into a mold and having them react in the chamber. You're probably most familiar with expanded polystyrene, either in the form of cups or the beads that fill beanbag chairs. Not to get too pedantic again, but Styrofoam TM is a particular brand of EPS made by Dow Chemical. So there's no such thing as a Styrofoam cup, but Styrofoam is used in plenty of other applications like packaging material. We should also distinguish between expanded foams and cross-linked foams. Like with thermoplastics versus thermosets, some polymer foams are non-crosslinked while many are crosslinked. For example, the soles of shoes, packaging for really delicate parts like electronics, those soundproofing panels you see in music studios, and yoga mats all contain crosslinkers, usually something like TOA or formaldehyde. If you've ever smelled a cheap $5 yoga mat, what you're probably smelling is formaldehyde, which is incredibly toxic. Hey, wait a minute. It seems like every single one of these examples has some sort of incredibly deadly component to it. Antimony in bottles, blowing agents in foam, all those toxic dyes and other chemicals used to make polyester fabric. It's like, it's like there's no way to escape it. There's no way out. It's plastic is poison and plastic is everywhere. And that means, oh my God. Oh my God. Everything is killing us. Aluminum is pretty cool, you know. Did you know that nearly 75% of all aluminum ever produced is still in circulation thanks to recycling? That's up from about 30% in the 1980s. Yeah, we've gotten really good at recycling aluminum, or as the Brits say, aluminium. <laughs> Weirdos. So good, in fact, that the process of recycling aluminum takes only 5% of the energy needed to process new aluminum. That's why most aluminum beverage cans contain over 70% recycled material. And even in industries like automotive sector and construction, the recycling rates for aluminum are like 90%. And what about glass, huh? Let's hear it for glass, a material that's 100% recyclable with zero loss in material properties. Recycling glass is also much less energy intensive and less toxic than making new glass out of sand too, since recycled glass doesn't have any of the free silica or heavy metals found in normal sand. Plus, in areas of the world where sand is running out due to climate change, Recycled glass can be ground into new sand for coastal restoration. That's really cool and it embodies a lot of the values of a circular economy that plastic could never. Hmm. Why isn't plastic recycling done in the same way? There are literally islands worth of plastic that can be reclaimed and turned into new material, right? 
and we wouldn't need to use all those fossil fuels to make new plastic. Plus, it'd save lots of money to recycle, right? So why aren't we doing it? Well, let's think about polymers at the molecular level again. Yes, I'm giving the rest of the lecture like this. Polymeric materials are really just bundles of long, long chains entangled together in either an amorphous blob or with localized crystalline regions. Polymers are never 100% crystalline because it's not thermodynamically favorable to sort thousands of chains into perfectly stacked structures. So let's do a quick comparison. Aluminum cans at the molecular level look something like this. A bunch of aluminum atoms stacked on top of each other in a well-organized pattern, known in the material science world as a face-centered cubic pattern. Pure aluminum nucleates into the structure pretty reliably as long as you smelt it correctly, which means you can take the same aluminum, break it apart, and reforge it together again to achieve pretty much the exact same properties every time you recycle it. Glass is also pretty organized, though not a perfectly structured crystal. Still, it's pretty easily to grind it down into bits and reforge it back into a similar structure with similar properties, strength, melting point, permeability, etc. Polymers are just fundamentally different from any other kind of material out there. Breaking apart these chains takes a lot of energy, and every time you break them apart, it weakens the properties of the material. Remember just how many of a polymer's final properties are reliant on its molecular weight, or the number of monomer units in the chain. Tensile strength, glass transition temperature, viscosity, elasticity, all of which ultimately impact how easy it is to process with extrusion, injection molding, blow molding, etc. For example, let's go back to fiber spinning for a moment. As the fiber gets stretched, the polymer chains go from having random orientation to having uniform orientation in the stretch direction. This is what gives fiber such high strength when pulled, though not when cut. Orientation matters a lot for good properties, and this is true for all plastic products. But the more you strain a polymeric material, including through the process of shredding and remelting, say, a plastic bottle, the material properties degrade every time. The crystalline regions get farther and farther apart, and the amorphous segments get less and less entangled. And this results in an overall weaker material, not to mention things like discoloration and ability to be modified with additives. It's just a simple fact that the breaking apart of these polymer chains through mechanical recycling degrades plastics properties. In fact, some materials have been shown to have a heat history once it's faced mechanical and thermal stress too many times, a deterioration that is irreversible. This is a problem that materials made of smaller molecules and atoms like glass and aluminum just don't have. This is why the material for bottles can only be remade into bottles about one or two times before having to be downcycled rather than recycled to make, for example, fibers for clothing, but never the other way around. You can make a bottle into fibers for a shirt, but you can't take a PET fiber and turn it into a bottle. It's just impossible. The properties have already been degraded too much. Here's a quick comparison between PET, the material used to make bottles and clothing, and RPET, or recycled PET. Remember that there's not just one material we can call RPET in the same way that pure water or pure aluminum can be understood with fixed known densities, viscosities, molecular weights, etc. What RPET is, is highly dependent on where the PET was sourced from, what its original molecular weight was, what type of material it was made into, and its whole heat history. Hopefully you're already seeing a problem for plastic bottle manufacturers who want to switch to RPET. As opposed to getting PET with consistent properties from whoever your chemical supplier is, RPET is an incredibly variable feedstock and can include PET of all different heat histories, colors, additives, and more. But even if your RPET feedstock is consistent, like in these studies right here, we can see some issues. RPET is notorious for yellowing, which means manufacturers need to up the amount of color-changing additives that they use. That's why the new Dasani bottles that are made from 100% recycled material have a slight blue hue to them. They literally can't help it. RPET also has a lower breaking stress and a lower break elongation. It takes much less energy for the bottles to break. All of this, plus some other complications in manufacturing, causes the price of making an RPET bottle greater than making a bottle with virgin PET, completely the opposite of aluminum and glass. This is why you see companies say, hey, our bottles contain 10% recycled material. 
they're not just being lazy. I mean, they are, but also some parts just need to be made out of mostly virgin material because the higher the weight fraction of recycled material, the worse the properties get. And remember, most plastics contain additives and colorants so as to increase their performance in the market. Feel free to pause to read this advertisement for bottle material that contains one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine types of additives just to make a simple, transparent PET bottle. And that's just single use beverage bottles. Never mind all of the UV stabilizers, plasticizers, oxygen scavengers, fungicides, pigments, toners, and more, and all other kinds of specialty bottles. This is a huge reason why many recycling centers will only accept transparent plastic beverage bottles, and in some cases, beverage bottles slightly tinted blue or green, but nothing else. They don't have the infrastructure to handle such a variable stream of plastics. As an aside, if you're the type of person who reuses plastic beverage bottles, please stop. The more that an individual bottle gets reused, the more likely it is for either microplastics or the antimony catalyst left over in the production process to leach into your water and damage your immune system. Plastic bottles are also hard to clean since bacteria can latch onto them, especially in the threads where the cap goes on. And in the case of polycarbonate bottles, like those trendy Nalgene bottles, they can leach BPA or phthalates, which are plasticizers used to help with the blow molding process, but are also endocrine disrupting chemicals. Can you see why I've gone Harley Quinn mode? Companies will insist that there's a difference between phthalates, endocrine disruptors, and polyethylene terephthalate, PET, but the science is still isn't 100% clear on whether PET itself is a problem if it leaches into your body, but honestly, why take that chance? Don't use these to store hot water and clean these bottles regularly to avoid bacterial growth. Or get yourself a metal bottle. It keeps things colder for longer anyway. All of this is a huge contributing factor as to why PET bottles are only recycled at a rate of 30% where it's stagnated for a few years now, despite being considered the most recyclable plastic. But to understand a bigger reason, let's talk about the corporate side of things. If you've ever taken your bottles to the grocery store to get five to 10 cents each, you might've wondered how that works or why the store accepts some of your bottles while rejecting others. The business side is basically this. Grocery stores have existing relationships with the food and beverage companies that stock their stores. Stop and Shop has Coca-Cola products plus a bunch of others, Whole Foods has their 365 brand, plus a bunch of others, with probably a good amount of overlap. When you buy something in a plastic bottle from a grocery store, drink it, and then return it, the grocery store pays you five cents up front. Then the grocery store calls up Coke and says, hey, this person just claimed their bottle refund. Please give us that five cents plus some handling fees. So it is ultimately Coca-Cola who pays for your refund. With some restrictions involved, of course, like stores that don't sell Coke products, probably won't refund you if you bring them a Coke bottle, and something you brought at Whole Foods might not be able to be returned at Stop and Shop, et cetera, et cetera. Plus, buying something out of state and trying to redeem it in Massachusetts probably won't work either. With that in mind, you might ask what incentive Coca-Cola has to participate in such a system. Paying five cents per bottle is more than paying zero cents per bottle, after all. Bottle deposit policy needs to be implemented at the state level, since here in America, states are the bodies of government with actual power to regulate the actions of corporations a little bit. These bills are actually really helpful. States that don't have them in place have a bottle return rate of around 20%, while states that do have them see return rates as high as 95%. Unfortunately, only 10 out of 50 states in this country have returnable bottle deposits as part of state law. The most recent bottle deposit bill to be implemented was put into effect in 2005 in Hawaii, with the previous one before that being implemented in 1983 in Massachusetts. Why has progress been so slow when these programs are clearly effective at increasing recycling rates? Let's have a think for a second. At some point in history, when Coca-Cola was selling their signature drink in glass bottles, there are actually many ways to return your bottles, and in some cases even get a refund. Making glass bottles is expensive, so Coke had a good reason to incentivize their consumers to send back their bottles. Most of you are probably too young to know of The Milkman, but if you watch old Andy Griffith shows or whatever, you know that at one point it was someone's entire job to go around door to door to collect used glass bottles and give you new bottles with fresh milk in exchange. 
So we've already lived in a world where companies take responsibility for their bottles. What's changed since the 1950s and 1960s? Well, what's changed is that big corporations like Coke successfully shifted the responsibility to recycle from themselves and onto you. Some people have a deep, abiding respect for the natural beauty that was once this country. And some people don't. People start pollution. People can stop it. What I just showed you was an advertisement ran in the early 1970s as part of the Keep America Beautiful campaign. When beverage companies like Coke started adopting plastic, they already knew all of the polymer science that I just spent the past hour or whatever telling you. They knew that plastic wasn't recyclable and that at best, plastic can be recycled maybe once or twice ever before needing to be downcycled and that it was more expensive to process RPET than virgin PET. But it was far cheaper for them to use plastic than glass or aluminum. So they didn't wanna stop using plastic they just wanted to have to recycle as little plastic as possible. So coinciding with the mass adoption of plastic in the late 60s and early 70s was the Keep America Beautiful campaign. Big oil and food and beverage companies ran a series of ads to make it seem like you, the consumer, were personally responsible for recycling rather than companies being responsible for creating the infrastructure with which to collect, sort, and process used plastic or educating on proper recycling techniques. These are just some of the amazing companies that paid an Italian American man to pretend to be indigenous and shed a single tear at you, the consumer for killing the planet. Yes, they actually cast a non-indigenous person to act out the anti-indigenous noble savage trope using the optics of indigenous people caring about the land while also being the main people responsible for polluting which just brings it all full circle with everything we've been discussing this semester about plastic pollution being a deeply colonial project. Coca-Cola and all the major beverage companies actively lobby against bottle deposit bills, or more accurately, they fund nonprofits who lobby against the bottle deposit bills on behalf of them so that they never have to be responsible for the plastic waste that they're generating, which, if you didn't know, was about 100 billion plastic bottles every year or about 200,000 every minute. This is to say nothing of how Coke devastates land by drying up local watersheds to make a product that requires hundreds of liters of water to make a single half liter bottle of Coke. In fact, Coke is less of a drink company and more of a water company, actively privatizing a resource that many would say should be a human right. While Californian citizens are asked to save water during the now annual drought seasons by not flushing their toilets, Coke and Nestle are able to maintain their business of stealing water from local reservoirs and selling it back to us for a profit. All, of course, on stolen indigenous land and usually without having to pay any sort of taxes and fees for doing so. Now I know what you're thinking. Anna, this sounds like some crazy leftist conspiracy theory. Coke made those new Dasani bottles made from 100% recycled materials, after all. And I know for a fact that they donate money to charities and business startups and even recycling programs around the world. Surely behind the scenes, they aren't that cartoonishly evil. Oh, here's a leaked internal document showing all the legislation that Coca-Cola is actively lobbying against. Okay, so this document was leaked by Greenpeace in 2017. And it is from Coke of Europe, but we can reasonably extrapolate that they're doing similar things in other regions to this very day. Here you can see a figure ripped straight from an internal slide deck, which you can read the full version of here. Various European Union bills are plotted on the axes of likelihood to materialize and business impact. And different clusters of legislation are designated as worth monitoring, 
worth preparing to fight against and stuff that they're currently fighting back on. Feel free to pause to read. In the monitor category, we have bills such as EU bans on advertising to children younger than 12, mandatory financial reporting, mandatory CO2 emission reduction targets, mandatory environmental labeling, and initiatives on product quality, aka using real sugar instead of high fructose corn syrup. In the prepare category, we have restrictions on caffeine, mandatory BPA labeling, packaging requirements for unhealthy products, a ban on BPA, which they perceive as very unlikely to materialize, yet still worth preparing for. And in the fight back category, we have laws on sugar imports, product taxes, refillable quotas, unfair EPR schemes, EPR stands for extended producer responsibility, and of course, increased collection and recycling targets, and an EU scheme for bottle deposit systems. If there are laws being put into place to regulate the plastics industry, the plastics industry is dedicating billions of dollars every year to, in their own words, fight back. This really puts a lot of their recent actions into perspective. I'm sure there are a lot of great people who work at Coca-Cola who are trying to figure out the plastic recycling problem and who really care about the planet. Coke is committing to use more RPET in their bottles, and they've been gradually rebanding their drinks to switch from colored PET bottles to transparent plastic. You may have noticed that Sprite is sold in clear bottles now, and Pepsi's Sierra Mist recently became Starry so that they could switch from green to clear plastic as well. And, you know, to switch from real sugar to high fructose corn syrup, but also the plastic thing. However, these actions are utterly dwarfed by the fact that any meaningful legislation, i.e. laws that would actually help the planet but also would hurt Coke's bottom line, are actively lobbied against and fail to get passed every single time. That is why PET bottles are only recycled at a rate of 30%. From a material science perspective, recycling is at best barely real and usually not real at all. From a corporate perspective, no company that wants to make money would support an initiative where they are responsible for recycling. So instead, they pass laws to push responsibility onto consumers and our failing recycling infrastructure. No matter how you look at it, plastic recycling is completely unrealistic. And remember, that is just PET recycling which is the best we can do. Never mind all thermosets, all products that contain more than one material, all plastics with high amounts of additives, and nearly all composite parts. And now we have to talk about the stuff that's genuinely really difficult to hear about. I won't show any gruesome images of people getting hurt or getting sick, but we have to talk about human health. All plastic has the risk of microplastics associated with them, and also PET has that risk of antimony leaching that I talked about before. That's about as good as it gets when it comes to plastic's impact on your health. By now, you've probably heard about the gruesome working conditions in garment factories in the global south. The trend of fast fashion brands from H&M to Sheen to Temu is largely responsible for these harmful working conditions. These workers who are disproportionately women are facing abusive conditions, working up to 16 hours a day, with most not even earning a living wage. They're the ones being exposed to all these incredibly toxic chemicals, everything from carcinogenic azo dyes, formaldehyde, and brominated flame retardants. Just like how most in the global north generally don't have to deal with the consequences of plastic pollution, folks in the global north generally don't have to deal with the working conditions as awful as the places where our clothes are made. Even in our country, workers, and disproportionately workers of color and people from low-income neighborhoods, have to deal with creating toxic polymer components like phthalate plasticizers and vinyl chloride monomer. It's also worth remembering that even if we were to regulate our own industries here in the U.S., these materials would simply become a black market here in the U.S., or the companies that make them would move overseas to where labor exploitation is easier to get away with. Just like how Coke is fighting against bottle deposit bills, I am sure that the factories keeping the Shein front page stocked with dozens of new garments a day are paying money to stay in operation elsewhere. These are global issues without any simple solutions, except perhaps the simple solution of rejecting consumerism as much as we can. Fast fashion only really kicked off in the 1990s, 
once polyester became cheaper to produce than cotton. Since then, H&M, Zara, Shein, and more have been able to take off, offering impossibly low prices and hyper-consumerist micro-trends, a culture of planned obsolescence where clothing is only in fashion for days at a time before being replaced. And remember, polymer fibers are impossible to reuse and make higher quality material. And while H&M has directed some of their billions of dollars in annual profit to try to reuse these fibers to make new clothes, this is still very labor intensive and not nearly scalable enough. Foam is a little bit easier to recycle with expanded polystyrene being fairly easy to melt down and densify into blocks for easy transportation. A truckload of EPS would hold about 1,000 pounds of loose material, but 50,000 pounds of these densified blocks of it, and it's easy to turn EPS into insulation, which has lower requirements for mechanical properties, but workers are still being exposed to toxic blowing agents like diisocyanate every day including the ones in the recycling centers doing the shredding and densifying. And finally, there's one other big practical problem when it comes to recycling, and it does have to do with both science and infrastructure. But first, a little exercise. Yes, I'm finally adding interactive components into these videos five weeks into a six-week class. Sue me. Take a minute to collect every plastic object on your person and within reaching distance. Consider your phone case, your pen, your coffee mug, and that plastic fork that you got your takeout with just now. Anything you got. Feel free to pause the video until you have them all laid out in front of you. Got them? Great. Now, surprise, they all have just broken. Your pen ran out of ink, your fork snapped on a really tough piece of chicken, and now you have to recycle them. And that means you have to sort them and put them into the right bin. So take out all the items that are made of just one plastic, like your fork, and separate them from the ones that have multiple types of plastic, like your pen or your phone case if it has a solid body and a rubber grip. You can also remove any items that can't be recycled, like anything made out of PVC or any cross-linked thermoset materials like rubber. Feel free to pause the video again if you need to. Now that you have those sorted, consider the items made of just one plastic. How many contain pigments, stabilizers, fillers, and other additives? These might disqualify them from being taken by your local recycling facility. Now consider any items that are made of more than one plastic, including basically all e-waste and lots of different forms of multi-layered packaging, like the Tetra Packs that juice boxes and certain milk containers are made of. All of these individual types of plastic, as in PET from HDPE, from polystyrene, from everything else, need to be separated and put into different waste streams. That's because most polymer blends are chemically immiscible. They just don't mix. Just like mixing oil and water, if you mix PET and HDPE, or really most combinations of plastics, they'll form two discrete phases like you see on top here. Some blends are slightly compatible, like PET and PBT, or PMMA and PBDF, and some polymers are even miscible if they contain similar chemical groups, but most don't have this feature. This is perhaps the biggest problem that needs to be overcome with regards to plastic recycling. Not just how do we recycle individual plastics, which is already near impossible as we've established, but how do we take a mountain of trash and either separate it into streams of individual plastic types or find new chemistries to try to make them compatible? From a chemical engineering perspective, our usual methods of chemical separation distillation, filtration, chromatography, don't work here, simply because of how polymer molecules work. Polymers don't readily melt or become soluble at low temperatures, meaning we can't separate them based on boiling point or solubility, so distillation is off the table. Polymers have really, really high viscosities because the chains are so entangled, so filtration and other well-established methods of separation for liquids are also off the table. Even just doing chemistry on monomers that have been already polymerized is difficult since chain entanglement keeps outside molecules from accessing individual chain units. Polymer functional groups can create unwanted side reactions during processing, like the chlorine atom on PVC separating and forming hydrochloric acid, which totally messes up the chemistry of reprocessing. And like I mentioned, most polymer blends are immiscible, so having a waste stream of three or more plastic types is just a non-starter. That's why a lot of recycling plants have manual human sorters to separate incompatible plastics, 
although some use technology like float tanks to separate PET bottles from their polyolefin caps and labels. New technology is being developed all the time to try to solve the separation problem, although much of it is still in the experimental phase, and we need solutions yesterday. For example, one strategy that researchers are experimenting with now is to use copolymers to make two incompatible polymers slightly more miscible. Basically, if you have polymer chains that include some segments of PET monomer and some segments of polyethylene monomer, that polymer should be able to stick to both PET and HDPE, making the whole blend into one phase rather than two. These work decently enough, but are hardly scalable to the massive problem of dozens or hundreds of types of plastic entering the same facility. There are other, more controversial methods of recycling, though, like this new pilot plant from Chevron, who just got the green light to produce jet fuel from discarded plastic. Sounds great, right? Turning trash into fuel? Well, not really, because the production of this fuel emits substances so toxic that the EPA determined that one in four people exposed to this air over a lifetime will get cancer. For perspective, this is thousands of times higher than the cancer risk for smoking cigarettes, and 250,000 times the cancer risk normally accepted by the EPA for new chemicals. The EPA typically limits chemicals that are shown to have a cancer risk of one case per one million people. Incidentally, another case of the threshold theory of pollution. So what is this fuel made of, and why is it so toxic? We actually don't know. Which is to say, Chevron knows and the EPA knows, but if you try to look up what specific chemical results from this plastic burning process, the EPA documentation on it is heavily redacted. This is extremely weird. Obviously, most companies have proprietary blends and weight fractions of known chemical reagents, but we pretty much never see the actual chemical name and chemical properties get redacted from documentation like this. This has led many to believe that if something incredibly fishy is going on here, with many asking how this ridiculously poisonous and air-polluting chemical was even greenlit in the first place. The idea that we can thermally convert plastic into new materials, a process generally known as pyrolysis, is often touted as a solution to the plastics crisis, but a 2023 study found that the environmental costs of making new plastic via pyrolysis were 10 to 100 times the environmental cost of making virgin plastic, which is a process that relies on fossil fuels, so you can imagine how many fumes that is. Oh, and by the way, the actual chemical plant where Chevron is producing this new chemical is located in Pascagoula, Mississippi. Using the EPA's own tool, the EJ screen, we can see that this is an environmental justice issue as well. The town is mostly populated by people of color and low-income residents, because of course it is. Thanks in large part to Chevron's presence in the past, the neighborhood was already a cancer hotspot, with a cancer risk 3.4 times what the EPA considers acceptable. Recently, as the company has been testing the pilot plant and winding up operation of this new deadly plastic-based jet fuel, the local community has started reporting strange odors in the air, so potent that their kids can't play outside anymore. Chevron apparently ran their own test and claimed that the air was fine, but this stands against the claims from hundreds of citizens about their own air quality. Luckily, the local community is fighting back against Chevron and the EPA. Cherokee Concerned Citizens, a local community group that formed in the area in 2013, has just filed a lawsuit against the EPA for approving this new chemical. With representation from Earth Justice, the lawsuit alleges that the EPA did not follow the chemical approval process laid out in the Toxic Substances Control Act. This Gizmodo article appropriately points out that Chevron's Pascagoula plant has failed to comply with emissions limits and safety regulations in the past, and that this pyrolysis product does not constitute biofuel as Chevron claims. Once again, Chevron is an oil and gas company, and try as they might to fund green initiatives at a very small scale to make themselves look good, these companies will never take actions to hurt their bottom line without government intervention. The citizens of Pascagoula are brave, and they serve as another fine example of what we can do when we band together and fight for a better future for the next generation. So to wrap up, there are lots of challenges with plastic recycling. Many of them can be overcome with technological developments like new catalysts, 
new copolymers and new separation methods, but many can't. While existing plastic pollution needs to be cleaned up, we also need a radical new approach to polymeric material design. What we need are new polymers that are made from sustainably sourced and safe reagents, not fossil fuels and toxic crosslinkers, plasticizers, blowing agents, additives, etc. And we need those polymers to be easily deconstructable, either back into monomers for repolymerization or into other useful materials. And here is where a new challenger is emerging. Recently, biodegradable plastics and compostable plastics have entered the market. These are, at least in theory, able to decompose so they don't take up space in landfills and end up polluting our air, land, and water. How exciting! Next week, we'll be diving deep into the world of bioplastics and figuring out if they really are all that they're cracked up to be. See you then, and happy learning! Mm -hmm.